All right, so good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jesse, and I want to say a huge welcome to all the families, students, classrooms, and science lovers who are joining us from across the continent today. We had over 70 classes registered for this program, which is wild and crazy, so welcome in. Uh, you are all here to take part in our special day celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So, as I said, my name is Jesse. I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. So this month, we kick out all the men. We spend the entire month of February celebrating incredible women from around the globe, and it is all because of today. February 11th, you are here on the International Day for Girls and Women in STEM. So we're hosting today's special discussion with Dr. Tamara Franz Odendahl in partnership with the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, better known as NSERC. International Day of Women and Girls in STEM highlights and recognizes the critical role women and girls play in technology communities around the world. And here in Canada, women have played important roles in helping our country accomplish incredible breakthroughs. And the government has been very supportive in creating new opportunities uh, to increase the number of girls adding their talent and ideas to pursuits like coding, engineering, and mathematics. We're fortunate to be joined today by one such supporter, Will Amos, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Science and Innovation, who's going to help us kick off the event. Will, thank you so, so much for joining us and take us away. Thanks, Jesse. Hi, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. I'm really, really excited to be joining the team here at the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council today as we're all celebrating International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Right now, all around the world, we're all seeing a push for more equity, more diversity, more inclusion, and not just in science and technology and engineering uh, and math, but but in all aspects of society. And as uh, as the father to a, a young daughter myself, as as daddy to my beloved Paloma Grace Flores Amos, who's 12 years old, and at uh, Collège Saint Joseph in Gatineau, I feel particularly strongly not just as a representative, as a member of Parliament, and as parliamentary secretary, but uh, as as a father uh, about sustaining this momentum. We know that we need to do that in this changing world, and that in Canada's uh, in, in this changing world, Canada's diversity gives us a huge, huge edge. And that's why our government is a proud supporter of programs like Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, which aim to get young women interested in STEM fields. Not only is a STEM job really exciting, rewarding, and, and well-paid, uh, it's the kind of work that can help you help Canadians improve their lives every day. And the important role that scientists play in society has never been more clear than it is right now in the midst of a pandemic. So thank you to the leaders uh, of, uh, in the STEM fields of tomorrow, and thanks to the educators uh, who are doing right now the most important work of setting up our students for success. And I know today's discussions are gonna be really, really interesting. I wish you the, the best of luck, and to all of you and to you and all of your families, be healthy and keep your distance. Thank you so, so much, Will. That was a great speech. And a uh, special shout out to Paloma, of course. Welcome in. Hopefully you have the chance to tune in live today or after the fact on YouTube. Uh, that was great. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are proud to partner with NSERC on today's event. Uh, NSERC is Canada's largest supporter by a big margin of discovery and innovation and a leading promoter of women in science and engineering. Before we bring on our special guest today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Danica Guzni, Vice President of Research Grants and Scholarships at NSERC, and invite her to say a few more words about the importance of the women and girls we are celebrating today. So Danica, thank you so much for joining us, and take us away. Thank you, Jesse, and good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Uh, as you know, at NSERC, we are very proud to be celebrating International Girl and Women in Science Day. Every day, we see up close the impact women are having on science, engineering, technology, and mathematics in Canada and around the world. Each year, NSERC provides research funding to women who are making incredible discoveries and life-changing breakthroughs. We celebrate the incredible innovations of women like Dr. Molly Shoikit of the University of Toronto, who was recently awarded Canada's highest honor for science and engineering, the NSERC Herzberg Gold Medal. We are also partnered with women like today's special guest, Dr. Tamara Franz Odendahl, who holds one of five NSERC chairs for women in science and engineering, leading a program that is helping more girls find their future in science and engineering. Today, we're only able to highlight just a handful of the many Canadian women who've made valuable contributions to knowledge with their curiosity, skills, research, and discoveries. 
but we hope that their achievements will help us celebrate more girls and young women, like those of you tuning in today, who will go on to make the next big breakthroughs that will help our world become a safer, healthier place to live. Here's a short video of just a few of the many Canadian women who have had an impact on the world of science and technology. What a video. I love that. I love that you highlighted not just past and present uh, scientists and explorers, but the fact that we highlight some future people too. Ella Chan was included in that, who I've had the pleasure of meeting. She is awesome. Uh, a little bit of hope for some of the younger girls in our today's audience, which is really exciting. So thank you, Danica. As you can see from that awesome video, Canada has such a rich history of women in research, each with their own special story that started with a passion for science. Joining us today to tell their story about their career and their passion for science is Dr. Tamara Franz Odendahl, as we've been highlighting today uh, throughout the broadcast today. Dr. Franz Odendahl is an evolutionary developmental biologist at Mount St. Vincent University in lovely Halifax, Nova Scotia. In addition to learning about her day job, conducting research and experiments in a lab, we're also going to hear about her role today as an NSERC Women in Science and Engineering Chair for the Atlantic Region of Canada. She's going to tell us more about some of the cool ways that she's helping more girls take advantage of opportunities in STEM fields. So everyone, whether you're live or on YouTube today, join me in welcoming Dr. Tamara Franz. Odendahl. Tamara, welcome in. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. So nice I'm to excited to be here. Yeah, fantastic to have you. Such a neat opportunity for all our students. We've got over 114 groups now watching in on YouTube from all over the place. So welcome into all of them. And I want to start off with a few questions of my own before we dive in with our, our classroom questions today. First and foremost, evolutionary developmental biologist. What does that actually entail? What do you actually study on a day-by-day -day basis? <laughs> 
Okay, so an evolutionary developmental um, biologist, or Evo Devo as we are known as, studies both evolution, so fossils, as well as developmental biology, so embryos, in order to understand living organisms today. So an Evo Devo biologist, it's super exciting to think of time on two different scales. So we think of time, the time it takes for an embryo to, to develop, which is days or weeks, versus the time it takes for organisms to evolve, which is millions of years. So Evo Devo, this field really gives one a deep understanding into, into the diversity of organisms living today and why they are so different. So on the slide here, you can see we have a chicken and a turtle. There's a long fossil history of these organisms. And by studying the embryos, we can understand many things about how they look today. For example, how the beak of birds develops, how that has changed over evolutionary time, why the beak looks different in different animals, and how the turtle got its shell. So studying both fossils and embryos enables this really unique perspective into understanding living organisms that we see around us every day. Very, very cool. I love this field. And for a lot of our students at home, uh, there's a lot of uh, books, popular science books on evolutionary developmental biology. So certainly once you get to the grade eight level and after, there's some incredible popular science reads to keep the learning going for this. So if you're keen as we continue through the broadcast, I'd encourage you to check those out. Tamara, so what are you what are you researching in your lab right now? So you leave this broadcast. What are you going back to the lab to study and what are you hoping to learn? Aha. Uh -huh. So my lab is really interested in understanding the skeleton and how it develops and evolves. So here you can see just how different the skeletons of animals are and how different they are from one another. And so bones are really cool. Not only do they fossilize well so we can learn about animals millions of years ago, but they're also constantly changing. So you may know or may not know that your bones are changing every day. New bone is being added old bone is being removed, and this happens on a daily basis. You may also not know that you were born with more bones than what your parents or grandparents have. So those are some of just some of the fascinating things about why bones are so interesting to me. And so now I'll tell you about some of the projects we're doing. So we have two main projects in the lab. Um, the first one is our Evo Devo project, which looks at the development and evolution of eye bones. And these are bones that are found in the eyeballs of a large number of animals. You and I don't have these bones, but birds and lizards and some fish do. So what we're trying to do is understand the genetic signals that are needed, to, that need to be present for these bones to form so that we can begin to understand why some animals have them and some don't. And if we can understand that, we're a little bit one step closer to understanding why these skeletons differ. And what's particularly cool about this project is that these bones develop in the same way as the bones at the top of your head develop. So through our study, we can also understand how our own skull forms. And then our second project, the other major project we're working on, um, is a fairly new project, but it's also focused on bone. And this project aims to understand the effect of gravity on animals, or really the effect of no gravity on animals. So why some, some animals can cope with weightless environments better than others. So for example, why do astronauts, when they go to space, develop bone loss? And why do some people develop osteoporosis? These are related research questions because the underlying mechanisms of what happens to the bones is very similar. So to truly understand these mechanisms, we need to first understand how bone develops. And so a lot of our research is trying to understand bone development and growth. And of course, it's not me by myself doing this work. I have a team of trainees, and you can see some of the pictures here, that are helping me answer these questions. So we have a lot of fun in the lab um, talking about bones and, 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 and uncovering all these neat, fa um, fascinating aspects of bone development. Very, very cool. Um, I mean, this is fascinating stuff. Was there a moment for you where you just, you know, it clicked and you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? Was there a single moment? Was it over the course of years? Did you start out with a passion in this or how, how did you get into this? Hmm. So for me, it really started with seeing an embryo develop for the first time. And that's what really sparked my interest. So all animals start developing as a great ball of cells, thousands of cells in a big ball. And then from there, they go on to develop into these incredible organisms. And so these are some of my favorite embryos, and maybe the audience can try and guess what they are. So the first one is a bat. Then we have a snake. We have a chicken, a human, a turtle, and a fish. But they all started as a ball of cells. 
so going back to your question about why why my where my interest in evo devo started it it was at university and it was when i was starting to learn about embryology and embryos and i was given a chicken egg a fertilized chicken egg and what we did is we made a little window a little hole at the top of the egg opened up the shell and looked inside and we could see that embryo developing live right in front of my eyes and that was super exciting of course i had to put the egg back in the incubator but the next day i came back and i was just amazed at how much development had happened in the span of just 24 hours and so that's why embryos are so incredibly fascinating to me and then on the flip side fossils have always intrigued me because of, of course bones are the most common animal fossil type and so studying evo devo really brought together um, my interest in embryos, bones, and fossils. And so it was a perfect fit for me. Yeah, that is, that, that is like the coolest series of pictures ever. I've never seen a batter snake before. They're kind of mind blowing. Uh, for a class in, in the Toronto area, if you've ever been to the Royal Ontario Museum when it opens up again, they've got like a series of embryos like that that you can see stained with the cartilage and the bones. It's just mind blowing. So I'd encourage you guys to check that out when you can. Um, God, that is so cool. All right. Um, so you've been doing this for years now. You've had the chance to build up this team of scientists you highlighted earlier. Is there a piece of advice you'd give to girls that were looking to go down the similar path? They wanted to become you for a career. Is there something that you'd share with them? Any insights from your career in, in STEM? Yeah, so I think my advice would be to do what fascinates you, do what intrigues you and really fo follow your curiosity. So for me, I didn't know where my interests would lead. I had no grand plan to be a professor. I never believed that I could have been a professor. But every step along the way, I took subjects that I enjoyed, subjects that fascinated me, and I was, I was never bored. In fact, when I started my career, the field of Evo Devo did not even exist. So you never know where your career may lead. So just follow your interests, explore careers as much as possible. And so that would be my advice. Yeah, and I think that that's so important. So many students go into it thinking that scientists have like this grand plan, they were a genius, everything came so easily to them and they just went one by one through the step end up where they ended up. And it's almost never the case. So many people have career stories like this. So I think it's so important for, for kids to yeah. hear. Fantastic. Um, so in addition to all your research, you run your own lab and research team. You've also been an insert chair in women in science and engineering for the past 10 years, which is mind blowing. So can you tell us a little bit about the programs you've been running as the wise chair for Atlantic Canada and how they're helping young women more get more involved in STEM fields? Sure. So as you can imagine, um, I've interacted with and met a number of girls and young women who are interested in science and engineering over the last 10 years. And in our Wise Atlantic program, we run a number of events like our science camp and our science retreat for girls, where girls can do fun hands-on activities, but can also interact with professional women in science and engineering careers. We have monthly career corner where young women can meet female scientists and engineers. We've developed video series, which features women in different science and engineering careers like talking about their jobs. So anyone can watch these on YouTube. And to me, it's really about seeing is believing. If you can see someone like you doing a career and you can speak to them about their career, then you can believe you can do it. And so that's really what the Wise Atlantic program is all about. Yeah, fantastic. I love the visuals there. So Tamara, is there a, can you tell us a little bit about some of the young women who've gone through your programs and what they're doing nowadays? Sure, so I'll tell you, um, First about Danielle. Danielle was a very quiet, shy young, young woman who attended one of our science camps. She was someone who enjoyed science, but no one in her family um, really knew much about science careers. Nobody was in a science or engineering career. So she learned so much at our camp and her parents were especially proud of her when she received one of our prizes for her great work in our science lab. And this is what really motivated her to learn more about careers in science. But my favorite pair of students I'd like to tell you about is Molly and Madden. And so Molly and Madden um, met each other actually at science camp when they were in junior high. And every year they came back to the same events and they are best friends now. So these young women are now science students at Mount St. Vincent University. Madden is specializing in neuroscience, Molly in science communication. And both of them work for us part time. They're helping inspire the next generation of young girls to consider science. So that's probably one of my favorite stories. 
That is a fantastic story. I love that you picked someone that's going to science communication, which is increasingly a huge field. We have a lot of girls, of course, today that are really keen on a lot of scientific disciplines, engineering, math, technology, all the things that we've been highlighting today. But science communication, the sort of people that we need to share those stories, communicate them to the public, I think is so mm -hmm. important as well. And so uh, I really appreciate that personally. That's great. So to wrap up before we go to our questions from our classes, uh, one last question, which is what are some practical steps that girls in, in elementary grades or in high school can take today that'll put them on a successful path towards a STEM career? So I think the, um, the, the best practical step is to connect with organizations like ours, um, Wise Atlantic, connect with the NSUC chairs for women in science and engineering across Canada, ask your parents or uh, teachers or guidance counselors to connect you, um, ask to be put in touch with women in STEM for the careers that you're maybe thinking sound intriguing to you. Uh, we have a huge database of professional women in STEM waiting to meet you and who would love to talk about their careers with you. So reach out to these organizations and um, tell people what you might be interested in. It doesn't mean you're going to absolutely do that thing. It's just you want to explore it. And that's what's important, exploring all the possibilities. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, for girls and for, for anyone actually in Canada today, there are more opportunities like this than ever. Even, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I was growing up and, and looking for science programs and careers in the past, none of this really existed in the way that it does now. So it's such an exciting opportunity for so many kids across Canada. Um, and yeah, fantastic, Tamara. Let's dive in with questions. We've got our, our five live groups. We've got groups on YouTube. So if you are joining on YouTube, let me know where your class is joining from or homeschool is joining from. I'll try and take as many questions there as I can as well. But we are going to start <coughs> with the Richard's class joining us in London, Ontario. If you guys want to unmute your microphone, you are good to go. You can kick us off with a question. Otherwise, what animal has changed the most since you've started your career? Sorry, can you repeat that? What animal has changed the most? Since you've started your career. Yeah. Has changed the most since I started my career. Well, um, evolution takes a long time for things to change. Um, I would say the organism that I've been most intrigued about has been seahorses. So I've done some research on seahorses and they are truly fascinating fish. Um, and how they have changed over evolution is, is really remarkable. Yeah. Speaking of which, a shameless plug here, we did a seahorse program with Ripley's Aquarium of Canada literally yesterday, which was amazing. So if you <laughs> want to join in with thousands of people looking at how cool seahorses are, I encourage you to check that out. Um, I want to head to Ms. Ball's class joining us in Goderich, Ontario. This is our high school class today. So Ms. Ball's group, come on in and uh, if you have a question, go for it. Uh, I was just wondering if you could tell us what we should know about um, maintaining our own bone health. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, calcium is really good for bones. Um, so that would be the first thing I would say. But the other thing is to exercise your muscles because your muscles are interacting with bones and bones have cells inside them that are sensing muscle activity. And those, those cells are signaling to other cells, telling them when to make more bone or when not to make more bone. So exercise is super important for bone health. Cool question, guys. We're going to go to Miss Yin's yeah. class. She's joining in Toronto for the first time ever in a live broadcast. She chose yours for the first time, Tamara. So way to go, uh, Miss Yin. Oh. Come in and unmute your microphone. You're all good to go. Yes. Hi. Hi. So we're all doing a remote learning at the moment, and I have a question from my class. Um, so you mentioned that collaboration. Uh, you were collaborating with uh, a group of trainees, and we're just wondering how important it is. Um, for uh, collaboration in scientific research? Oh, collaboration is key to science research. It certainly does not happen in isolation. Um, every researcher who um, is making new discoveries has a team of scientists that they work with. And so on a daily basis, we're interacting with other people, talking to other people. It's a very social career, a lot of conversations um, and a lot of brainstorming on how, you know, why why is this happening in the embryo? What What's going on? And brainstorming ideas. It's, it's really a lot of fun. And yeah, a super amount of collaboration goes on. 
Yeah. I think it's one of the most abiding lessons of scientists and explorers whenever we bring them on the broadcast is that no one does this in isolation. So many people mm -hmm. collaborate with you know people around the world. That's kind of one of the best things about science is that you have the opportunity often to work in very remote places, go around the world to go to conferences, collaborate with people and uh, share those sort of stories. So great question, Miss Yin. Let's also go to Toronto, more virtual learners. Uh, Mr. Boccia's class, if you guys want to come on in, take us away. Hello. Hi, um, I have a question from my class. They were interested in the embryo one, and they wondered how long you can keep an embryo. Well, it depends on what sort of embryo. So a chicken embryo takes 21 days to hatch. Um, so in depending on which animal you're talking about, the, the time it takes to develop is different. So some animals take a very long time. Um, as I say, chicken is 21, but if I compare that to the fish that we have in my lab, it's you know 72 hours, and it goes from a ball of cells to a fish that swims around and eats. It yeah. truly is amazing. It truly is amazing. That is very very cool. Thank you, Mr. Bocce. Great question, guys. I'm going to take one from YouTube, and again, for teachers on YouTube, if you want to share questions, please do. Um, this is from Miss Heyman's class in uh, Gray Bruce uh, Elementary Remote School. What is your favorite embryo? No pressure. Is there one that jumps out as your the best? <laughs> hmm. I have to say the bat embryo that I showed you before. Um, I just think it's yeah, it's it's an amazing embryo to see how the front, how the wings are forming, different to the legs, and it's and how they have the wings in front of the eyes. I really like that. It reminded me of that, like, you know, see no evil, hear no evil thing, but they should just have a bad embryo for that picture instead of the monkey from now on. Like, it'd be perfect. Very cool. Um, welcome into Miss Fudge's class. Joining us in Annapolis Royal in Nova Scotia down the road from you there, uh, Tamara. So welcome into that class and, and any others as well. Uh, let's go back for another round with our live groups. We've got tons of time. This is great. Um, so Mr. Bouchard's class, if you have another question for us, your mic is unmuted um, in a second. And uh, come on in. Right. How long does it take for cell no, bones to fully develop? Well, that's a great question. Again, it depends on the animal or organism that you're talking about. So there are, if we take a chicken, for example, when it hatches, it can run around. So all its bone development happens while it's in the embryo, while it's in the egg. So that's, you know, 21 days. If you take something, another bird, if you think of an owl, when an owl hatches, it doesn't run around. It sits in its nest for weeks and weeks um, while its parents look after it. So it takes much longer for its for its legs, for example, to develop. So it really is very specific, not just to the type of animal, but how the animal behaves once it's hatched and if it really needs to or always born, if it really needs to run around immediately when it's born, then all its bone development is happening while it's growing. That was a great question. It was a great question. Uh, before we go to our live classes, just got one from Miss Smith's class during on YouTube. Uh, you mentioned fossils in your presentation. Is there an amount of different fossils you've ever studied in your career that you can share with us? <laughs> sure. So I grew up in South Africa, which has a very rich fossil history. And I did my PhD, which is, you know, five year um, research study um, program all on fossil giraffes. So these were giraffes with short necks. And what we were trying to understand in that particular study is why all these giraffes had died at a certain time point in their life um, and what was, you know, what was causing their death. And so it was really interesting because we got into starting to look at pathologies and diseases that these giraffes may have had. And so that was a very cool project and one of my favorites. Yeah, very, very cool. By the way, South Africa, I was wondering where the accent was from. There you go. Um, <laughs> let's head to Ms. Ball's class. If you guys have one for us, come on back in. Go for it. Guys. I just wondered, um, if you're working with fossils, how much travel has been a part of your career? Yeah. So that also varies depending on um, which fossils one studies. So. Um, for me, I do a lot of my fossil research by going to museums where the fossils are already collected and analyzing those specimens. So I would I would travel to museums. Um, but there are other um, fossil researchers called paleontologists that actually go out into the field and collect fossils. And so again, they would be going where where those fossil deposits are. So that could be all over the world. 
Awesome. Again, uh, travel collaboration, these uh, lessons sort of keep coming up in every single scientific discussion. So I'm excited we get those questions. Thanks, Ms. Ball's group. Uh, let's go to Ms. Yin's class again. Uh, if you have another one for us, come on in and then we'll wrap up with Mr. Bocci in just a minute. So Ms. Yin, go for it. We're just wondering how many bones do babies have and how does that number change? Yeah. <laughs> so glad uh, that's a great question. So babies are born with uh, just over 200 bones. And the reason the numbers change is because many of the bones actually fuse during growth. So after the baby's born and those first year of life, a lot of bones are fusing together. And where there were two bones, there's now one bone. And so we see a reduction in the number of bones because there's so many fusions that are happening. Yeah. Is that like related to that like soft spot on baby's heads? Like it needs to, yeah. Yeah, so that's bone growth in action right there. <laughs> Mildly terrifying for anyone who has to handle the baby, but very, very cool. Um, all right, guys, if there's any more questions on YouTube, you guys have a couple more minutes to let me know, uh, but I will go to Mr. Baccia for one last one from our live group today. So Mr. Baccia, go for it. Hi, um, I have a lot of students that are interested in science. Do you have any general recommendations for girls and guys that are interested in science? Yeah. Um, I would say let adults in your life know about your interest and um, explore careers as much as possible. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. Even, you know, if you, you know, Google different universities, by, you know, there's a list of every single faculty member that does research at the universities email them and say, hey, I'm a high school student. I'm interested in what you're doing. I get a lot of those requests and it's fantastic to talk to students of all ages about what, what I do. Um, so don't be shy, reach out and you never know what a connection might lead to. You might end up with a summer job in their lab one summer. Yeah. It's quite amazing how easy it is to connect with scientists nowadays. Uh, again, pretty much every time we've had a classroom that we've inspired to do that, it leads to some really cool stuff. So I'd really encourage our kids today to, to do exactly what Tamara mentioned. That's a fantastic opportunity for you guys. And again, more resources, more organizations than ever before. So if you want to learn coding, engineering, biology, you know, astronomy, it's all out there. It's so accessible and, and more fun than ever. Um, I was going to wrap up, so I lied, Tamara. I'm going to take one more question. We've got to go right to the camera in, in Mr. Bouchard's class. Uh, so our one more student, go for it, guys, and uh, wrap us up from there. Why do turtles live so long? Ooh. Oh, why do turtles <laughs> live so long? Um, I don't know if I really know the full answer to that question. I think you've stumped me. Um, so their bone growth is very slow. And um, as long as bone turnover is happening and the, and the tissues in the organism are regenerating and turning over, the organism is going to carry on living. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different, different answers to that question, but that gives you a little bit of insight. Uh, it's a great answer. It's very hard to evolve into a turtle biologist in the course of one broadcast, so I think that's a noble uh, <laughs> attempt at getting that answer in. Uh, guys, this was so, so much fun uh, for all our, our speakers, for Danica, for Will. Thank you so much for your special messages at the beginning of the program. Uh, thank you so much to our classes joining in on YouTube from all over the place uh, and our live groups. And Tamara, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our, our live classes to say a big thank you and goodbye with me. So Mr. Bouchard, Miss Ball, Miss Yin, and Mr. Bocci's groups, if you want to join me in saying a big thanks uh, to Tamara, you guys are all in. Thank you guys so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Congrats thank on joining you. Us. Bye, thank you.